Hi everyone, my name is Adam. Welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to be continuing work on the Peacock Mandala. This will be session number three. Thanks for joining and let's get right into it. Okay, so as I mentioned in another video, the reason that I started working on mandalas was actually due to watching a video by a fellow YouTuber named Struthless, um, who had been talking about advice that he had received from an artist who said basically the key to success or to launching a successful career is just draw the same thing every day for a year, I guess. Um, and so he went ahead and did that and got really tired of the subject that he picked as he relates and eventually realized that like the subject was actually secondary. It was more what you were communicating and the meanings that were going into things. So I began to work with the subject matter of mandalas just because I had happened to be playing with the radial symmetry in Photoshop for a bit. And I also remembered back when I was in art school for ceramics, of all things, talking to visiting artists who were mentioning that, you know, they had been in residencies and whatnot, and that really the only thing that they needed to do was to kind of pick something to do and follow along with it. And so I, I began to vibe with that. I've been taking classes for a long time. I did go to art school back in the 90s for ceramics. Um, I had 2D, 3D design, you know, back before computer assisted anything was, was real. I had a career in graphic design. Hush, kitty. Shh. Hush. You're fine. And I've been taking online classes since COVID began just to kind of make the bridge back into digital art. I have a full-time job. So, you know, back in the day in the 90s, I, I never really learned how to draw. Um, I did learn some value studies and I really liked working with pastels. Uh, and charcoals and anything that was smudgy and, you know, quote unquote, painterly, where line wasn't really a thing. But I began working in Photoshop more and more recently, starting in 2020, just because I already had the subscription for work uh, for myself. And so I needed to kind of get back into things and pick up the, the program again. And I saved up my pennies and bought a Wacom Cintiq 24 inch uh, monitor display tablet with the stylus, which is what I use here. And for this, um, it just kind of happened by accident that I did my first couple of mandalas. I was just literally playing around with the uh, radial symmetry options in Photoshop, which are kind of underappreciated tools. And I mean, this mandala is now like, <coughs> I don't know, number six or seven that I've been working on. And the ones that started, I had been really working just to get line down and then started throwing in all of these colors that were going into them. So the line would sit on top and the colors would go underneath. And What's happening here in the Peacock Mandala is that you'll notice that there's all the color layers looks kind of blocky and it's being refined with different sketches and things happening on top of it. I had just finally gotten tired of sort of the flat color. I was never really into the cartoon aspect of things. Again, as, as someone back in the past, I, I used to be quite loose and quite smudgy and I really liked build up of color as you see here as we're de detailing the different uh, peacock neck feathers um, and so I just decided with this one that especially given the subject matter and the fact that it's very hard to render the illusion of iridescence 
without building up layers and layers of colors, one on top of each other, playing with transparencies, as opposed to flat blocks of color with maybe some shading to indicate light or lighting or give it a stained glass kind of backlit uh, or inner glow kind of look. So that's what led me to do this treatment. Now, the bad thing is, I mean, the good thing is that it's, it, it is hard work, but it reward, it pays off dividends. Um, the bad news is that it, it makes things take quite a lot of time. So I, this has taken, I mean, what we're watching here sped up really took me literally hours to put together. And at a certain point, you just kind of stop. Um, and this is with the outline layer turned back on. So you'll notice that I'm beginning to, you know, take my time here to shape the lines more, um, to really kind of use outlines consciously and to determine areas where they're not necessary anymore. Um, you can create edges and things within the artwork without needing to rely on stylized thick border lines and boundary lines. Uh, but since that's what I came from, I did want to use it. And that's why I began this with my mandala journey. I mean, it's been about three months now. And so after three months, I've kind of gotten tired of the mandalas, true to form. Thank you, Struthless, for pointing out the wonderful technique that was pointed out to you, so paying it forward. Um, but what it, what it has done for me is it's shown me that after many, many, many months and months of playing with like value studies and not really touching color, that I have a pull towards these jewel tones and I appreciate these kind of, uh, you know, transparency and depth and texture effects with color to suggest highlights and shading and shadows. And, and I'm not saying that I'm very good at it, but I, I do have sort of the eye for color and um, I, I wasn't willing to even admit any of that before I started playing with the mandalas. And it was like, I, I needed the mandalas to to allow me to own the gifts that I was bringing to the table because it was one thing to draw the lines and to utilize the lines in the radial symmetry. But that's kind of a, almost like a cheap trick because Photoshop's doing that for me. Uh, knowing when to switch to different kinds of uh, treatments and uh, you know, when to utilize these different embellishments and whatnot. That's one thing, but within Photoshop, uh, you know, drawing the lines and building up the patterns for the mandalas, it almost feels like cheating because when you watch people who are doing this by hand uh, and laying out guidelines and then really making sure that they have the same angles of curve and arc on both sides of their you know, their leaf patterns or, or the lotus blossom leaves or the petals or whatever it is that they're doing. Uh, the more traditional, historical, uh, Hindu and, and Far Eastern mandala patterns, which of course is where the art form really developed. But I don't claim those cultures, so I felt okay in, in moving away from it. But at the same time, you know, throwing the color in showed me that it almost felt like I was making coloring books for myself <laughs> as an adult. So, uh, you know, I did have those discussions that were, while I was making it, like, what am I doing? Is it really art that I'm doing? But yet I would achieve some really stunning effects um, for me that I was quite proud of when I would be done with things and, because the finished product kind of pulled all the different elements together. Uh, you know, my design sensibilities from working for over a decade as a graphic and packaging designer professionally, um, my, you know, sense of the emotional impact of colors, balancing different colors, the basics of color theory that I got from, from my career and my training in art school back in the day 
before computers were really a thing for artists. I mean, they were. They always were from the beginning, but it, not like this. But, um, you know, seeing the finished product made me realize that, you know, it doesn't have to be difficult in order to count as art. Uh, you're allowed to use the tools that you have at your disposal. Uh, the, the ancient masters, the Dutch masters, uh, would do studies with optical, uh, you know, optical projections in order to, you know, learn the perspective and the proportions between different shapes and sizes of the body. Um, it has been debunked that they didn't use them all the time for their masterpieces, but definitely those tools were known to them for the optics to use lenses in a certain way to project images from life onto canvas which would enable them to learn uh, and it's the learning that was most valuable not the copying not to suggest that they you know used it like a reverse light box but they did have the option to kind of project images on canvas and on paper and to do sketches and make make their studies that way so so i mean a lot of this with the color it's funny watching this back in a higher degree of speed because i remember making the different choices as i was going and there's a certain amount of of experimentation that you just you have to give yourself license to do and it's kind of like the gentler side of um fuck around and find out <laughs> as it were because it's like i wonder what would happen if i did this well the only way you're going to learn is if you do it and so you know set up those extra layers uh get ready with your undo levels and just get ready to you know push the boundaries as much as you can Some of this work I did obviously between sessions, I try and record, but sometimes um, I'm also a big fan of doing artwork when you can. Like you, you don't need long stretches of time. The fact that I'm still kind of haven't yet recovered from the isolation of COVID, I've, I've developed almost a hermit's perspective on things means that I have a lot of time to myself. But that's, that's not gonna last forever. So you, you do learn very quickly to um to grab the spare moments here and there and just do a little bit you don't have to do everything you just have to keep going uh, you do that long enough and sometimes it'll catch you and you'll find yourself like oh i was only going to spend 15 minutes working on this but now i'm here like eight hours later uh, which has happened absolutely has happened um or there's just the days where it's like, I don't want to do art. I don't want to do any of this. And then you just, uh, you push through to just do that two minutes and then you stop immediately. It's like, well, I did my two minutes, leave me alone. Um, but that two minutes is valuable because it's, it's priming the pump. It's keeping things going. It's reminding your subconscious that there's a, a challenge or a design question or colors that need to be worked on um, something in a visual scenario that needs further further digestion, further thought and reflection. So, um, yeah, I I'm, I'm a big <laughs> I'm a big fan. Uh, used this extensively back in the day when I was in art school. Back when art school was kind of required to do anything, I guess, if ever. But you know, early '90s. Um, but I'm a really big fan of sleeping on it. It's amazing how much you can let your subconscious brain just chew on something until it comes up with a solution. And if you tell it when you need the solution by, or you get in the habit of like, okay, this is due tomorrow. So I'm going to go and I'm going to lay down and I'm going to, you know, take a nap or I'm going to fall asleep tonight. And then tomorrow I'm. I just, I trust, I've come to the point where I trust that the solution is going to present itself. Um, even if the day before you didn't want, like the, you were screaming, like, no, I don't want to do anything on this today. I don't want to be anywhere near this stuff today. Uh, you find yourself really immediately kind of running back to the page because 
your subconscious will give you suggestions in sleep or when you wake up all of a sudden something will strike you as being a potential way that you can work on something and then you just sort of you grab the moment and you don't let the moment go so you drive yourself you end up driving yourself back to the page um, and the composition and so it 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 can be fun um, to to sleep on things because you will end up not only coming up with answers or new things to try that might lead you to the answers uh, but it it also presents uh, you know the reason or the way to get over like artists block um, whenever you don't want to go back to the page there's a problem that you haven't resolved and you may not be willing to admit it and it may not just be visual it could be something larger but there's a problem going on somewhere in life um, relating to the art piece in some way even if it's just like well this particular color reminds me of aunt emma and she and i never got along and um you know whatever it is it's it's purely emotional at least for me uh, and you just kind of get going and even though it's tedium right i mean i'm i'm t taking the time to talk over this one because i realized like it's great that we have the the music and all but um what makes this interesting i would think is kind of like well why did you do that so here i'm trying to show this cross section of you know imagine that the water kind of came to an edge of glass and i've kept aquariums in the past i don't have one currently going uh, they take a lot of time and they take a lot of space and i'm living in manhattan so those are two things that i do not have uh but <laughs> um you know i i still haven't quite gotten to the point where i can present that like you know you're looking in at the side of the aquarium through underneath the surface of the water yet um i i need to do more studies with that uh so that's something that i will end up doing and it I do end up going back in and going back over that that water at a certain point here. But there's so many things. Um, I work at 5,000 pixels by 5,000 pixels at 300 DPI. The 300 DPI is just a bad habit left over from when I used to work as a graphic designer in print because you never want things to go into the production studio without having enough resolution to be recreated when they come in and do it for print. So um, the other thing that you'll notice is that, you know, getting up tight and uh, up close and personal here is that a lot of this line work is really shaky. Um, it's not something that I would consider to be refined. It's, you know, there's wobbles. My thicknesses uh, are not complete. And so I gave myself permission to just kind of do the initial and then walk away and come back to it. And in coming back to it, I'm kind of really feeling the stylization of these fronds or uh, strands of the large peacock feather, which is, this is the base of the large peacock feather that has the eye medallion up at the top. Um, the eye medallions off to the left uh, are just color blocked in. And so, you know, as I'm, as I'm doing this, I'm hopping back and forth between a few layers. Uh, to always keep my bounding lines on one layer and the color, uh, you know, on a couple of layers, like the regular color plus the shading plus whatever. And so this is my moment now that I'm going back in and I'm working over everything to really uh, refine it all down. Um, one of the things that I noticed in looking at close-up photos for reference work on these fronds that I'm admittedly stylizing quite a bit, uh, but the, I just, if you just put all the straight things out there, then it wouldn't be as interesting. And I still have, uh, there's other plans for ways to, uh, to texturize this, to make up for the lack of, you know, cohesive uh, feather strands but one of the things that i saw when i did the close-up was that uh, you know the iridescence the the shading of the feather fronds had like this glowing greenish yellow in the center and 
very much of a uh, that dark, almost black um, midnight blue, which I'm using as the as the basic ink colors uh, for the edges. So here I'm building up color on the background layers and playing with merge modes and ways to get it because, um, you know, one of the benefits of working digitally is like, try it. If you don't like it, back it up, try it again. Um, all these different options of the ways that the layers merge, like how to get that visual interest in the background color um, and get the shading just right. So, um, I began to have the idea here with those fronds that, you know, if I went in with a slightly soft edged brush for the edges, um, I would be able to demonstrate the, that feeling of like almost a dark blue halo that when you look at it straight on, there's the, the green with the brightness, um, and the highlights in it. And then those little... Uh, glows were to pull the background out but you get tired and you have to take a break so that was uh that was like six hours right there anyway um so thank you uh we'll end tonight with a view of that centerpiece because it's really developing very nicely and i am working as i usually do from the center out but um, yeah, thank you so much for joining and for watching and listening along. I hope this might have contained some help for you, and I hope that you might be inspired. If nothing else, remember to sleep on it. <laughs> You'll be inspired by your own subconscious the next morning, and it's a good way to get over artist's block. Thanks, and have a good one. <laughs>